we're going to talk about geometry. Ask spaces and related construction. And uh, so the talk today will be based on uh, works, uh, uh, doing works with uh, Christopher Shu. And uh, Roy Campo. Okay, so <clears throat> um, let me first uh, uh, introduce our spaces. Uh, for this talk, I'm gonna work. Uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, work over complex numbers, but in fact, uh, the general definitions and many of the results work uh, on. Uh, on, on arbitrary perfect fields and uh, for more general objects than the one we're gonna talk about today. But just to set up the, the setting, so I'm gonna denote by X, maybe defined by time a polynomial equation inside CN, a uh, complex algebraic variety. And uh, I will denote by delta inside C, um, uh, formal disk. Uh, you think about the parameter, uh, the parameter of the disk uh, to be denoted by T. And um, so what is the arc space of X? The arc space is a space uh, denoted by X infinity, which parameterizes arcs on the, on the variety, which are just maps, uh, regular maps from the disk to the variety. And uh, so if we're gonna think about as a parameter space, uh, this is actually not just a, a set or a space, is a, in fact, is a, is a, is a right object, it's a scheme. And when I write in this way, what I'm really describing here are its complex uh, value points. Um, so the way you think about an arc is that you have a, a formal disk, delta, which I also always, always think of writing this way, and this is just a map from the formal disk to the variety X, which uh, send uh, delta to some small arc on the variety. And uh, you can think of this as just being a Taylor expansion of a, of a parameterized curve. <clears throat> so, how do you think about, uh, um, how, how do you give an arc? Remember X uh, in, in my setting is, uh, is an affine variety, it's contained inside CN. So how do you give an arc? Well, in concrete terms, you just give an anupole of power series, form of power series, so it's gonna be some AI plus AI prime T plus AI double prime T square and so forth. So there would be just an arc on, on CN, but then there's a condition that uh, when you plug inside the equations of, uh, of the variety inside the arc, it has to vanish identically. So what you do is you just plug this inside the equation, you expand it, and then you, you realize that you get some, uh, some coefficients in T. And uh, all you need to ensure is that is to make sure that the arc lies on, on the variety, you just need to make sure that all this equation vanish. So you just need to set this go to zero in the power series ring. And, uh, and that just corresponds to, uh, to define X infinity um, by, by some vanishing of some equation to zero. And this vanishing, uh, I, you think about this as being the variables. And so now you realize that you start with n variables, all of a sudden you have uh, infinite many variables. So this realizes x infinity inside an infinite dimension of a fine space, which I just briefly denote in this way. And so this is uh, defining infinite many variables by infinite many equations, and then this is gonna have something as uh, infinite dimension. So it's not a typical object that we study, in, uh, you know, that we first care about in algebraic geometry, but in fact, it carries a lot of information about the original variety, and that's why we look at it. 
Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's convenient just to think about the equations and the, and the coordinate directly, and so think about the coordinate ring. Okay, so, um, so let me know by A, the coordinate ring of the variety, which in my notation is just some polynomial ring, modulo certain, um, certain equations. And, uh, and now I'm going to do it by A infinity, the coordinate ring of the arc space in this setting. Well, this will be just uh, some polynomial ring in infinite many variables modulo my equation A. So, so this, this is how you see that in fact you get a scheme. If you start with an affine variety, you're going to get an affine scheme. But that's not a fine effect. Um, there is another way of, of constructing arc spaces, which is come from the uh, from the J schemes. So the J schemes is uh, is the same definition of arc space. The only thing is that I impose this condition modulo t to the n plus one. So just slightly many uh, truncation lateral expansion. The idea is that x infinity as a truncation map to the J schemes, which is defined similarly. This is just a mo going modulo t to the n plus one. And then you can think of the arc space as being the inverse limit under these truncation maps. And um, what is nice about this approach is that these are nice objects because these are now schemes of finite types. That's something that we are more comfortable working with. On the other hand, <coughs> there's some issue I'll try to understand this relation. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. Okay. So suppose, for instance, X is smooth. Suppose that X is a smooth variety. For instance, X is just the N. Well, then uh, when I look back to this equation, I realize that I have no, no conditions on the coefficient. So all those coefficients, AI, uh, prime, double prime, and so on, they're completely free. And uh, <coughs> what you realize here is that this is a, it, it, X infinity is a very nice object. It's like it itself is infinite dimensional affine space, which are these truncation maps. But what I want to say here is that the truncation maps are kind of nice. So maybe uh, let's say there's a space here. So thinking about uh, this is a truncation map from X infinity to XN, to final level XN. And if you just think about this, it just means that uh, I'm truncating uh, the, the first n, n variables, uh, m times n variables. Uh, so th this this nice this is a nice separation. So the fibers fibers are isomorphic to uh, some infinite infinite dimensional uh, fine spaces. And and um, so how do we use this space, for instance? How does this has come up, for instance? And uh, the idea is, for instance, that if you look at S to be a constructible set inside X, X, uh, the, the J scheme, what you do is you take the inverse image, they call it C, and you call this a cylinder. So cylinder is just the inverse image of a constructible set. These are actually the, exactly what are the constructible sets in the in the in the in the in the arc space itself. This is not a, a something a fine, uh, the Syrian, so the definition needs to be adjusted. But this is is a class of constructible sets in the arc space. So these are the objects that we typically look at. Um, sometimes uh, it's convenient instead of just looking at the set itself, to just look at the generic points. So the generic point, this is not a point in this, in, in this set here. It's a point, in fact, there was a residue field is a infinite transcendence degree over the complex numbers. So it's a very, very uh, thick point. Um, so this come up, for instance, looking at this picture in, uh, in the smooth case. I'm talking about the smooth case here. In the smooth case, for instance, this can happen in motivic integration. Uh, 
maybe I put a couple of names here. We go to Konstevich. The net loss there. And other people. So what does the multi integration do? So you should think about this truncation and this uh, Taylor expansion, a little bit of an analog of, of the Piatic expansion. And uh, so if you think about now uh, Piatic integration, you int the, the level set in Piatic integration are analog of the cylinders. So <coughs> you put a measure on, on, this, on, on this Piatic, on this set of uh, the Piatic numbers, in the same way you're gonna you're put a measure on, on the cylinders. But the measure this time is gonna be motivic. So you're gonna put motivic measure on cylinders. Uh, basically set the, the measure of a cylinder C. Well, this is an infinite dimensional object. You want to define some, some sort of a motive. And what you do is that you do look at the base. And the base is gonna be an algebraic object of finite type. So you can, uh, you can, um, you can take the class in the Grotteny ring. And then what you do is that, uh, of course, uh, there is a, a choice here of which level I'm gonna pull back the cylinder. I'm gonna go a level up and take inverse image and inverse image. So I need to, I need to uh, adjust so that the definition is independent of that. And the way you do this is that you add a factor here where L is a class of a line or a fine line, the Grotteny ring. So now with this definition, now this is a well-defined measure on the set of cylinders. And that's what goes in, in the definition of motivic integration. And then you write the motivic integral is an integral is, is a computed over the arc space of a variety. What you integrate is an exponential function where the, the, the base is a class of a line. And then you integrate the order of some function. Well, this is just an element, a function on the, on, over the variety. Okay, so I'm not gonna get too much into motivic integration. I just wanted to mention this because I just to show that arc spaces has been used uh, in applications. This is, an, this is an important application of the proof of the battery conjecture on Calabiao, on Barasan and Calabiao's. And another application that I want to mention here, uh, again, in, in the case when X is smooth, we looking at exactly the same picture, is uh, connection to singularity of pairs. And in particular, the idea is that when I look at minimal law discrepancies, so minimal law discrepancies are these measure of singularities that a lot of people here are super familiar with, that are central in the, in the minimum model program. And we want to study properties like inversion of a junction and semi-continuity and these sort of questions. And uh, Arc spaces provide a, provide a geometric object to answer some of these questions and maybe try to answer other questions as well. So the idea is that minimal discrepancy, if, if I give you a pair on, on a variety, or well, it's made out of two pieces. There is a discrepancy part and there is a valuation of, uh, of, your, of your boundary divisor. And the idea is that you can encode both, uh, both, quantity, both quantities by looking at these uh, this cylinders. In particular, if you look at the order of vanishing on a, along an arc like this, this will, will, will measure your valuation. And, uh, and now the question is, where is the discrepancy coming from? The idea is that this set here has a finite codimension inside the arc space, which is the same as a codimension of S. And all you need to do here is uh, to, to compute that. So you, you look at the codimension of this set C inside x infinity, and that will be your dollar discrepancy. So the idea is that a divisor evaluation over the variety will determine naturally an arc on the arc space, a particular arc, this particular arc will be the generic point of a, of a cylinder, and now you compute this invariance from, uh, um, from, uh, from geometry of our spaces. So this is useful, for instance, if you want to see what happened in a family, the generations, the restrictions of some varieties, and these kind of questions. 
So maybe put a couple of names here. So the connection was uh, first uh, uh, realized in, by Mustafa. And then uh, it was further studied in Ayn. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, what I mean by collimation? Yeah, so in this case, when X is moved, so there are many equivalent definitions. So I can think of just a dimension of S as a constructible subset, irreducible constructible subset inside X, XM. It's really the topological codimension of C inside X infinity. Another way of thinking of this is that it's gonna be the dimension of the local ring at alpha. And in this case, yeah, in the sing, no, no, no. In the singular case, uh, uh, I'm gonna come back to that. So for the, for the moment, I, I'm considering discussing the smooth case. And, and my interest actually is to understand the singular case. I will say in the singular case, this needs to be adjusted. Uh, and uh, this also needs to be adjusted, but then you still have a correspondence and I, I'm gonna come back to that, yeah. And it's an interesting question to understand, the, the interesting question is understand the adjustment on this side. So we're gonna get some different version of uh, so discrepancy, which is always an integer. So, um, so what can we say if X is singular now? So this has become all of a sudden, the structure become a lot more complicated. Okay, so the truncation map are complicated. Again, this is a truncation map, but you know, when you just look at truncation between J schemes, uh, those are not subjective. The fiber dimension jumps, and, uh, and uh, it's just hard to understand these maps. For instance, already a, a, a big theorem here in the theory, the theorem of Greenberg from the 60s, well, it was not really phrased in, in, this, in this language, but that's what the theorem says, talking about solution on a, a modulo e to the mth and lifting of solution. But what the theory implies here is that the image of X infinity is constructible in XM. Um, this is an infinite dimensional object, so you expect that uh, in principle when you try to lift things, they're gonna be infinite many conditions, but in fact, uh, if you lift to a certain level, then everything they lift to a certain level, they will lift all the way up. Um, going back still to the 60s, uh, another, another example of, uh, show the interest of, of, of looking at this object in the singular case is the Nash problem. Okay, so now in this case, I'm gonna, the, the Nash problem when X is a surface. So what does the Nash problem say? I'm gonna explain it with a picture. So suppose I give you, can you see this uh, surface here? Okay, so, so suppose I, I give you X a surface here which has a singular point. And uh, so what I'm gonna do here is that I can look at X, X or oh, actually Y, so the minimum resolution. And the minimum resolution is gonna extract uh, an exception divisor. And uh, if I write Y here, and exception divisor going to by AEI. Um, I can also look at the arc space here. No, the arc space has a truncation all the way down to X, which takes alpha to alpha zero. 
um, away from the singular locus, this is a very nice vibration as we described, but over the singular locus, the fiber is more complicated. And Nash's observation is that though it's complicated, I still have finitely many components. These components are going to go by CI, and the generic points, maybe call it a, alpha I. And uh, so I find the many reducible components over the single locus, over a single point, say, in this case, in this picture. And, uh, and uh, the last problem is the existence of a one to one correspondence between the set of uh, uh, div uh, exception divisor EI in the resolution and the set of reducible components uh, CI on the arc space. So, what, what a statement is that the arc space. C is a minimal resolution. And the correspondence is very geometric, is very natural. I think about the valuation that each EI determines. And to this, I associate an arc alpha I determined by the condition that the order along alpha I is equal to this valuation and is maximus. Meaning that alpha I is the largest point I can pick with this condition, it's easy to see that this uh, is a unique such a point. That's uh, the point I want to associate to the user evaluation. And um, so this correspondence, it's easy to see that there's an injective map. Um, sorry, it goes the other way. It's easy to see that there's an injective map this way. And, and the, the half part of, the, of solving the problem is to show that in fact, uh, uh, for each uh, exceptional divisor, there's such a component. And this was solved uh, by Fernandez de Bobadilla and Pepe Herrera. Uh, 60 years later. No, 60, 60 years later. So six, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this application that I kind of mentioned here briefly of these theorems, the Greenberg theorem uh, and the Nash problem, motif integration and this application to singularity of pairs, what do they actually use of the arc space? What they really use of arc space is the topology, the topological structure of the arc space. And uh, perhaps uh, here they also use uh, the geometry of this constructible set in the arc space. Um, but the, uh, the arc space is a scheme, and it's kind of a complicated scheme. So it's natural to ask uh, about uh, the scheme structure. Okay, so my qu the question here, how about the singularities? And when I say the singularity of the infinity, again, I'm really thinking about what, what can I say about X infinity as, as a scheme. So there is a couple of theorems that I want to mention here. So the first theorem I want to mention is, is a theorem of Greenfeld. Greenberg and Kasdan. So, it says the following thing, suppose I start with an arc, uh, defined over the complex number, the arc is the, like in my original definition, so a close point in the arc space, think of it. And uh, so I look at the arc, and as soon as this is non-degenerate. So what this means is that it's not fully contained In the singular locus of the, of the variety X. Okay, so under this condition, so just uh, stand outside of the single locus a little bit. So this implies that when I look at the formal neighborhood, look at the arc space, and I look at the formal neighborhood at the point alpha, I complete around the point alpha, this can be written as uh, the completion of something which is a finite type, a scheme of finite type, tensor, an infinite dimensional uh, formal scheme. 
uh, cost uh, in the category of a form of skincare. So this is, a, if you want to think about this as being a five dimensional singularity. Okay, this was motivated by some questions in the representation theory. Let's say this again. No, 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 that is, no, no, it's not inside that. Uh, um, so yeah, that comes from the, from, the, from the construction, but it's defined within uh, uh, these many variables. Just uh, basically what you do is that you apply various separation theorem to eliminate a bunch of variables and end up with a finite object. Oh, X is a variety. X is a variety, yeah, yeah, for most of, for, for all these applications, I think X will be a variety. Um, okay. So another way of writing this is that you look at the local ring uh, uh, by O alpha and uh, the, no, the local ring in the arc space, you take the completion and all you're saying here is that this one will be the completion of a local ring uh, for a scheme of finite type, Z here, to which you are joining a bunch of variables. Many variables. So this is interesting because again, you think about these two, these three theorems here, and uh, what they say in different ways is even though this is a is an infinite dimensional object, it's really wild. There's some finiteness built in. You know, these uh, constructible images, the finite domain components, and on the singular locus, and this finite, uh, finite type of singularity, they can be considered as a finite statements, uh, finiteness statements for the arc space. Okay, so another theory I'm going to recall here is work of Regera. And so Regera is uh, uh, maybe the first person I really focus on this uh, generic point uh, for the constructible set uh, and, and their local rings, I, I would say. So, If I look at the generic point of a, of a cylinder, I'm gonna call this a stable point. And maybe I should say, I forgot, uh, I'm gonna assume uh, it's non-degenerate. Then this is what we call a stable point. And uh, so what, what she proved is uh, that when I look at the local ring, and I look at the completion, now this is Noetherian. The local ring itself in general is not Noetherian and the completion map is kind of complicated. We don't even know whether it preserves dimension. Um, but uh, this is a statement, this was motivated because from the Nash problem, because from this, uh, the Noetherianity allows you to construct a little uh, arcs on this ring and this little what is called the curve selection lemma. Which is a, a key ingredient in the solution of the Nash problem. Okay. So I look at these two theorems as being the first steps in trying to one, yes? Is what? No, so the difference here is uh, that we are kind of looking at extreme, extreme cases. Over there I'm looking at C value points. So these are the closed points in the arc space. Here I'm looking at this uh, kind of generic points. So they have, have kind of a very, very large points and the finite coordination. Oh yeah, same alpha, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, those are, uh, yeah, those are, maybe I should have made more precise.
Okay, so now let me come uh, and talk a little bit about uh, uh, my, my work now on, on, on the subject. So I, try, I want to understand more, I have some tools to actually understand more about the structure of our spaces. And uh, so the starting point is a formula on the module of scalar differentials. Okay, so the way you, you uh, yeah, I want to understand, uh, I mean, if, if I understand the, the module of scalar differential on a scheme, then I actually know a lot about the scheme structure of, of the scheme itself. And uh, <coughs> so the way you, uh, we do this is the following. So you start from uh, X in, uh, for X infinity, and you look at X infinity cross beta. This is really a computer cross. So if this is a, think about this as being universal R. And uh, as any universal family of a modular space, you're gonna have an evaluation map, you're gonna do by gamma to X. And uh, this is easy to see explicitly what these maps are when I think about uh, coordinate rings. So the coordinate rings of X infinity is denoted by A infinity. This has an inclusion inside A infinity double bracket T. And now the question is, what is this map here, gamma sharp from A? So this is not a natural in, uh, uh, composition of inclusion, but it's rather, the, the, this is the key map, the universal R, so it's defined as follow, what is the uh, gamma sharp of F? Well, you take the polynomial F, then you take this uh, formal derivative of F when you take uh, X and X primes, times T, then F double prime, T square, and so on. So this gives you the universal R. So the theorem here is that you have the following description of uh, omega x infinity, and I'm gonna write in, in the algebraic language from there, that what you wanna do is that you have a omega of x, so that's a module over x, you pull it back, and then you tensor, with, you, you twist it by some sheath or some module, so you call the infinity, over infinity, and then over, did I write this correctly? Uh, or A. So this gives a module over A infinity double bracket T, and then you just regard it as a module to push it forward to X infinity. And that's the formula. So uh, let me tell you what uh, infinity is. So if infinity is the following uh, object, is A infinity is a, is a formula one series in over infinity modulo t times infinity double bracket t. So as a module, this is just a direct sum for n greater than zero of a infinity e to the minus n. And the, the way this come up is that you want to think of this as being the pre dual of, uh, of the, of, uh, infinity double bracket t. Think of this as being a very part of the n as a infinity module. So this formula is, <coughs> is not very hard to prove. And, uh, but it's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very convenient formula to, to, to make computations and to actually prove theorems. So let me just explain where this formula comes from. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the idea here is that you need to say, what, what, what corresponds to give a tangent vector x infinity at a point alpha. And the claim is that given a tangent vector of x infinity, this is x infinity, 
I give a point alpha and I want to know what is a tangent vector v, the claim is that this is the same thing as gain a, a vector field. on x along the image of alpha. You're going to just write alpha, but really the picture now that this is x here, alpha now is a little arc, and I'm thinking about giving a, a vector field along the arc. So this is similar to the classical uh, statement about, uh, uh, you know, uh, tangent vectors of moduli space of mass. And you can also have an interpretation of this uh, if you think about the Jacobian matrix. This, the giving the presentation for the uh, module differential on X. And then you think about what is the, Jac the Jacobian matrix giving presentation. All of a sudden you have all these variables. Uh, so these are the two Jacobian matrix and the content of the theorem is that this one can be written as a block matrix as follows, just taking the matrix J and then computing, putting J on blocks along the diagonal, and then computing some uh, derivations, uh, derivatives of this, of this matrix and so on. If you, if you uh, unwind what is written here, then you find a, a lot of uh, uh, relations between uh, partial derivatives. It's kind of interesting to check actually. Any questions? Yeah. So no, this one is a general, this is a general theorem. This works for scheme of arbitrary base, basis. Yeah. <coughs> but for, for most of the application I'm talking about, it's good to have a variety of other settings. So let's, uh, we need to. <coughs> uh, So let me talk a little bit about a few applications. So when we try to understand the geometry of spaces, uh, this formula will become very handy. <coughs> so we're gonna focus on local rings and we introduce, uh, so again, I have a point, uh, an arc on X infinity, and now I really think of it as being a, like a, a schematic point, so it can be kind of any type of point. And, uh, and I'm looking at a local ring. And introduce two invariants uh, here. One is embedded dimension. This is just the dimension of the tangent space. And the other is embedded codimension. And this will be the codimension for the tangent cone inside the tangent space. Sorry, can you see this? Maybe I put it up a little bit, forgot. <coughs> so, <coughs> the first assertion is that these invariants actually carry interesting information about the singularities of X and also are related also to motivic integration. <coughs> So for instance, you can show the, the embedded dimension of alpha. The first thing is that this can be shown to be the same as what we now call the jet codimension of uh, alpha inside x infinity. And that's uh, something related to the codimension I was talking about before, computed at a jet level. But uh, more interestingly is that this is equal to uh, some this low discrepancy. So let me actually write a formula, Q times the order along E of the Jacobian of F plus one. So you think about this as being a low discrepancy. Uh, if, uh, if alpha corresponds on the correspondence I explained before to the uh, to evaluation to a divisor evaluation like this. Q is an integer, order of E is a divisor evaluation. Uh, and uh, that's the correspondence and E leads uh, of some model y to the map f to x. So this is a discrepancy, this, this law discrepancy is called the matter law discrepancy. So it's different from uh, um, 
the mean or log discrepancy, but there are way of measure the difference. So it relates to the log discrepancy. In, uh, and uh, <coughs> so an another thing that we can, we can show here, for instance, is that suppose now I, I, I think about, for the moment, let me write this uh, in a smooth variety, and this is a smooth variety, and this is a popular rational map. Actually, let me know some smooth here. I just say why it's smooth, but actually singular. So think about the low, low resolution singularity. And, uh, <coughs> and suppose I gave you, so this induces a map at infinity, for y infinity to x infinity. Suppose I give you a point beta here, a map here, and I look at the image up inside here. <coughs> and then we can, uh, uh, it's very quick uh, to relate. So you start with from, uh, there is a, uh, an exact sequence about chiffre differentials here, the full back of chiffre differential from x to y and, uh, and the relative differentials. And all you need to do is just apply the formula to that, compute a, a tau sequence, and just look at the terms. And using that, you, very quickly, you, you, you compute the, the, the meta dimension of the ring downstairs is equal to the meta dimension of the ring upstairs, plus a correction term, which is the order along beta, or the Jacobian of the map. And um, the nice thing about this approach is that, first of all, the computation are very quick and systematic using that, that uh, formula, but also we can relax a bunch of hypotheses here. For instance, I don't need to assume that y is smooth, I just need to keep track along the exact sequence of all uh, other terms that come up. And um, similarly, I don't really need to assume that this is a rational map, and if I put the right conditions, so there are more general formulas that are kind of beautiful. And you, you want to think about this as being uh, a numerical analog of uh, the change of variables formula in multiling integration. So you also say something about the singularity of x infinity. For instance, I define what it means uh, for a point to be stable. So uh, a stable point um, is uh, I, I get this generic point of the cylinders, and uh, maybe not fully in a singular locus on the non-degenerate. And what is easy to see is that a point is stable if and only if this num the meta dimension is finite. So um, this is useful because this gives a, a, a new and very quick and conceptual proof of Regera's curve selection lemma. Uh, another thing is if you look at a point in x infinity uh, of a complex number, um, and this point is non-degenerate, if and only if the embedded co-dimension is finite. Sorry, uh, what do I say? This is any point. So any point is, uh, is a point is non-degenerate if and only if the embedded co-dimension is finite. And uh, <coughs> you think of this uh, and then you realize, uh, and this is the question that uh, we had before, you realize that this implies a converse to uh, the Dreamfeld greenberg kajdan theorem saying that that theorem is optimal, meaning that you cannot expect to have a finite dimension of singularity, if uh, a finite type singularity, if the point is not stable. Um, another thing, in fact, uh, I can look at this as a way of measuring singularities by the following statement, is that um, for every alpha, next infinity, it's a medical dimension of our alpha, is less or equal than the order long alpha for the Jacobian ideal of x. Again, this is defined by the partial derivatives of uh, the equation of x. So the way you want to think of this is that you have an arc is fully containing a singular locus, it's non-degenerate, it's degenerate, and then this number is infinity. And as soon as the arc is not fully containing a singular locus, I look at the, what is the contact order with a singular locus, and this, uh, uh, reduces the co-dimension of the medical dimension of the point. 
So showing that the, the arc phase is getting uh, less singular as we move away from the singular law. And then we also prove a semi-continuity theorem. For this, this invariant. So this is interesting because uh, this invariance, even in the stable case, these local rings are non Euclidean. And uh, so there is a famous paper by Lex on, from the 60s about uh, semi continuity of, uh, of this invariance uh, for Euclidean for lo local rings. And this gives a, uh, I think, a good extension of the theorem beyond the Euclidean setting. Okay, and then uh, there are other, other applications that we'll now discuss here. Um, so maybe I stop here for a moment. If, you, if there are any questions, yeah. Yeah. No, this is uh, certainly something that I've been thinking about for some time. Uh, so this work of uh, uh, I, Musasa, Yasuda, they proved this conjecture in the local computing intersection case. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, again, the, the tricky part here is that we want to understand, uh, where is it? The connection between that law discrepancy to um, the usual law discrepancy. And there is a correction term, if you understand the correction term very well, in the local computing intersection case. Um, beyond that case, uh, this still give a good approach to that. But what is interesting about the semi-continuity the semi-continuity of the embedded co-dimension implies immediately a semi-continuity statement on the matter law discrepancies. That semi-continuity goes the opposite way. So the, semi, the matter law discrepancy, actually minimal matter law discrepancy is gonna jump up, not down uh, when you get to the singular point. So what you need to do is to measure the difference uh, and show that the difference win the tie. And uh, so certainly some of the theorems that uh, we prove, I think, provide new tools to study that. Not there yet, <laughs> but uh, certainly thinking about it. <clears throat> okay, so in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, I want now to look at this again, uh, go back to the to this formula on, on the Shiva differentials. And I hope, again, I didn't go through all the application. There are more applications, for instance, we have some finiteness of arc fibers uh, that's uh, our latest uh, uh, paper on the subject, which is also gives some interesting uh, application. Um, but the idea is that this formula is actually quite powerful. And uh, again, it's not a deep theorem. This one is not a deep theorem. Uh, but, but it's very useful for when it's written in such a compact form, it's so, so simple to apply, it actually becomes a very powerful tool. And the question is, uh, what our interest in this point is also to see whether we can reproduce similar formulas for other constructions. And um, so let me, I want to talk a little bit about that in the last few minutes. Generalization for instance, Grimber space. Grimber scheme, I guess. Um, and the related spaces, for instance, Grimber scheme, uh, um, arithmetic jet scheme, uh, arithmetic or arc spaces, maybe for arc spaces, etc. So arithmetic arc spaces they were defined by Bouyoum. They were uh, studied by Bouyoum, well, Greenberg scheme that was a uh, uh, researcher for a while. Um, <clears throat> so these are very uh, they're closely related spaces uh, to, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the case of arc phase. And maybe one way of thinking about the main difference here is that the arc phase, I walk over a field, uh, I think about it as a constant field. Whereas uh, when you talk about Greenberg schemes, arithmetic arc spaces and, and other construction, you typically walk uh, over a base, which you don't regard as being just a, um, not just a field, maybe over a curve, over some uh, discrete evaluation ring, something like that. And uh, so the idea is that I want to think about this generalization of uh, being arc spaces 
for the various version of uh, differential rings. And um, depending on the setting, whether you're working characteristic zero, you're working in positive characteristics, you're working in mixed characteristics, there's gonna be variation of the correct notion. And, uh, and their fibers. Okay, so for instance, the Greenberg scheme we're gonna come up as a fiber of such an object, and uh, the arithmetic act phase will be such an object, and so on. And um, so what becomes uh, quickly uh, evident by just looking at these settings is that we cannot hope for such a formula. This formula really uses explicitly this construction of this infinity, which is very explicit given the, 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 the power series construction very, being very explicit and easy to write down. And so you cannot expect to have such a formula. I don't even know if there is a, a module you're gonna tensor by to reproduce the formula. So it's clear that we need a, a different approach. And we are working on an approach. Uh, um, via tangent categories. Uh, adjunction, tangent categories, adjunction. Uh, maybe I should men just mention that this is in progress. So, Let me just try to give an idea of what we're thinking here in the case that we discussed in, the, in this lecture. So this is the case of, a, of the act phase over a field, over a complex number, say, field of characteristic zero. Okay, so let me take X again to be spec, spec A. A is a coordinate ring of X. I think about X infinity as being spec of A infinity. And now we work over K, we say the complex numbers, but it's easy to write K for me, so I'm gonna write K. And uh, <clears throat> what I want to do now is uh, to interpret the theorem, the proof of the theorem, and the definition of that we have, uh, we use in this uh, to prove the theorem, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, category theory. So, I want to think about x infinity as a functor of points, um, and um, <coughs> um, so what you do is that you look at the, the category of algebras of k. And, uh, and I have a functor here, denoted by J, which is uh, the one we, we apply here to consult the arc space. So J applied to an algebra A is gonna be the algebra A infinity. And uh, the idea is that this functor arises as a, as a left adjoint to another functor, which I'm gonna denote by W, uh, where it's defined as follows, W of algebra B is just the, B double bracket B. And, uh, and the adjunction here is exactly what characterizes uh, the, arc, uh, the, the arc phase as being uh, having exactly those points, the arcs. So, and in fact, this adjunction there is a, even a way of getting both functors in a more natural way using differential rings. So this comes from a triple adjunction. So think about the, the category of algebra uh, over K. And now think about the category of differential algebra over K. 
and there is a forgetful functor. Um, so, oh yeah, maybe. so this forgetful functor, I, mean, I give you an algebra with the differential structure, which is constant over, over k, and uh, uh, so three over k, and, uh, and I just forget about the differential structure and just think about the algebra itself. So it's a, that's a, a very elementary functor. And then you can prove easily that this has a right and left adjoint. We will not by J tilde and W tilde. So these are joints of the forgetful functor. And, um, and these are exactly the same functor. The point here is that on this, uh, on this algebra, there are natural, naturally defined differential structure uh, and that provide the right and left adjoint. Um, the reason why I bring this up is that I want to think about this as a gateway to the other settings. Okay, so there are the settings that we want to explore with the different spaces, but we're not gonna walk over a field, we walk over uh, particular types of differential ca algebra categories and, uh, and, and uh, objects, and then uh, we're gonna reproduce a similar picture and we're gonna construct these functors in that way. So that's one part of the story, the construction of the arc space. So the other part of the story is uh, the, the construction of model of differentials. So, so this also can come from an adjunction. The way you want to write this is as follows. You have algebra over K, and then you look at the, at the category of modules over algebras over K. So an object in here will be noted by Rm, where M is a R module. Okay. So this also has a, there is a natural, there is an easy to write functor here, defined by P of R M, B R plus epsilon M. This becomes an algebra when I just epsilon square equal to zero, the obvious multiplication. And, uh, and this has a, a left adjoint, which is called an omega. In our case, uh, that's exactly what we expect to be. Omega of A will be equal to the module with over A given by omega A over K. So when you put these things together, uh, all you need to do now is to form a diagram. So let me just write a diagram. So you have algebra of a k, algebra of a k, module over algebra of a k, module over algebra of a k. And what do we have? So we have the, the functors here, the, the one above. So uh, which I write up going up is j, and going down is w. Then you have these functors here, which is omega and p, and again, omega and p here. And what, what I want to do here is to construct analog of j and w, I call it j prime and w prime. We'd be, again, we'd be a, a, a joint functors. Uh, and then I want to make sure that this diagram commutes. And uh, the point is that we actually have this uh, written in the formula. So, what um, the, the, the W functor is easy to write. So W prime of M, M R, this is just, you apply W to R, and then you apply W to M in the obvious sense. You just take M tensor over R over W R. Uh, yeah. Let me actually write it just to make over R. That's what W R is. So that's, uh, that's easy, that's easy. This is an easy one to define. What is a, at least I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. What is more complicated to define, the tricky one is J prime. J prime of R M will be J of R, which is R infinity, 
And then uh, what you do here, you don't tensor with R infinity. How you do it, you tensor with uh, this sheet, uh, Logan series in T, modulo T, uh, double bracket T. And this is what we call T infinity. And uh, so then you check that these functors are joined to each other. So they form a joint pair. Now you have a diagram of some functors. And now what you do is that you stare at this diagram and uh, I want to show the diagram commute. What does it mean a commute? Well, uh, according to a junction, so I need to go from here to there or from there to here. And it's easy to see the commutativity with the easy functors, W prime and P. So it's easy to see that uh, uh, P W prime is equal to WP, that's easy. And this implies that now I'm gonna go with a junction the other way, if I do J prime of omega, is equal to omega j prime. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm out of time. Uh, and this is a theorem. This is a, just say that the formation of R spaces commute with the formation of, uh, of uh, um, shift of different model differentials. Um, now the question is, uh, I want to do the same without relying on the formula. A and you can. The idea is that you want to interpret this category as a tangent category to this category. There's a notion of tangent category. It's a little bit like, uh, think about this as a map of, uh, uh, of, of, of manifolds. And I just look at the tangent bundles over the manifold. So I have a tangent bundle, a tangent bundle. I have a, have a map of manifolds and it's gonna give you maps, the, uh, tangent maps on the tangent uh, bundles. So you do this, you, you create this diagram. And then these functors will be just the, the, the associated tangent maps to these functors. This functor will be constructed by uh, uh, the uh, left adjoint. This is an easy function to define, the other one will come up as a left adjoint. And, uh, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>